We have the best of the internet for Thanksgiving dinner. We've got Riesling, we've got Sincere, we've got Pinot Noir, we have Zinfandel. And we also have two wines that we came up with in our process. We're gonna taste all those with the dish and we'll see what happens. Hi, this is Tracy Garner from Pairing Base. Please subscribe to our channel. So we want to know from the internet which wines it says are gonna be best with Thanksgiving dinner. We scoured every corner of the internet and came up with tons of ideas, and these were the top four. Riesling, Sancerre, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel. We also came up with two ideas on our own. We're gonna, we're gonna taste all these guys with the dish and see what happens. We're also gonna show you what to ask for in the wine store to get a fantastic pairing with this dish. So check it out and see what you think. What we usually do here at Pairing Base is we take a bite of the food to see what um, experience the food creates, what we feel we might want next after a bite of the food. So let's do that. Think traditional Thanksgiving dinner. A lot of people think about that Thanksgiving dinner is full of big flavors, but actually it's kind of mellow and kind of mild. It's more like a velvety texture than anything big going on. The other thing I'm noticing is that the, um, the stuff in Thanksgiving dinner, the, the dressing, the mashed potatoes, the stuffing, all that stuff kind of sticks to your mouth. And so it seems like this dish really calls for something with lots of acid to wash that away. But again, the dish itself is kind of subtle. So I can't imagine you want something with a big flavor to, um, to come in and really sort of blast that away. Here's the problem. Riesling, <laughs> it's got a big flavor typically. So let's see what happens. And there's another problem. So the internet said that Riesling is one of the uh, best wines with Thanksgiving dinner. It did not tell me which specific Riesling. And the problem with Riesling is that it can be from any place. It can be any sweetness level. And they gave me no guidance as to which one is gonna be best. And I can guarantee you that each one, each type, you know, say a different place, different sweetness level, is going to taste best with the dish. So I gotta tell you, internet, you didn't really do me a lot of good uh, in telling me which wines can be great with the dish. But I got one that I thought would be good. This is a dry Riesling from Austria. Uh, let's give it a taste, see what happens. I'm gonna give the wine a taste by itself initially, see what happens, but again, I don't, I don't have high hopes because I expect it to be pretty aromatic and I expect it to just blow the, the dish away. Let's we'll see what happens. I'm gonna taste the wine by itself. That's big flavor, nice acidity, lots of um, a sort of limey character, some um, minerality there, a mouthful of wine. Delicious wine. Maybe a good wine for another place, but I can't imagine if it's gonna work with a dish. But let's find out. First, we're going to um, take a bite of the food. Nice and mild. Mm. <laughs> that is not good with a dish. I'm, um, I'm left with that sort of stony minerality, and still that, that liminess is, is persistent. The, the, the stony minerality is where the wine took me after buying the food. It is not somewhere I want to go. And it, that, that stoniness really is persistent. There are places where that, that, uh, that aroma, that flavor, would be welcome. Maybe with some, some shellfish dishes, but it certainly is not welcome with this dish. Um, <laughs> it would be a glutton for punishment. I'm going to taste it again. Uh, I can't imagine that people would like this. I'm trying to find the wines that when you serve to your guests, you sit back knowing that your guests are gonna look at you and say, you, know, you nailed the pairing. And if you find your way to this wine, again, a great wine by itself, not just in the wine, great wine by itself. But if you find your way to this wine with this dish and waited for someone to say, wow, you nailed the pairing, it's not gonna happen. Um, again, you get a mouthful of sort of stone and liminess that has got nothing to do with the dish at all. So that's not a good pairing. I hope that I, <laughs> I can steer you away from this particular Riesling uh, with, the, with the dish. Maybe Riesling in general, I'm not sure. If there are some specific Rieslings that you've had that are fantastic with traditional Thanksgiving dinner, please let me know. I'd love to, um, to find the best pairings. I'm not biased against any kind of wine out there. I just want the good stuff. And uh, maybe the reason that you know, it's recommended so many times is because there is something good, but this, this isn't it. People recommended Riesling because of the acidity and they thought it was a very acidic wine, it'd be great with the dish. 
but they forget all the other stuff that goes along with it. That stone, uh, minerality, and that liminess, uh, and all that stuff <laughs> makes it a no-go. So I know that you, after a bite of this stuff, you're gonna have this weight in your mouth you're gonna want washed away. You're gonna want a wine that has lots of acid, and Sancerre is known for its acidity, so maybe that's great. But Sancerre is also known for the, the grassy notes, um, the herbal notes, uh, and I don't know if that's what you want with this dish. Uh, let me taste the wine by itself and see if I can get an idea if we're gonna be in a good place. That's typical Sancerre flavor. Um, although this one is a little bit different. There's uh, New Zealand Sancerre and there's Loire Sancerre. Loire Sancerre is usually you know, very dry, high acidity, those grassy herbal notes I talked about. Uh, New Zealand Sancerre is usually high acid but very fruity and expressive. Sometimes <laughs> Loire Valley Sancerre can be a combination of those two. And this one strikes me as kind of a combination of the traditional Sancerre flavors and a little bit of that tropical fruit sneaking in. And again, I'm left with a lot of minerality here. So we got high acid, good. Grassiness, good. A little bit of tropical fruit. And Thanksgiving dinner. Is that gonna be a good combination? <laughs> I don't think so. But like I always say, you know, I'm open-minded. I love every wine. So if it works, it works. I just can't see it happening. Let's give it a taste after a bite of food. The reason we taste the wine after a bite of food is not just because that's what you're gonna be doing when you decide whether it's a good pairing or not, but because the food, or really specifically the food residual, what's left in your mouth after a bite of food, will change what this wine tastes like and give you a different flavor in your mouth. So the experience you're getting after a bite of food is not the same experience you get when you taste the wine by itself. That's important because a lot of times when people recommend a pairing, they think that the wine is static. They might say, well, the wine has nice lime flavors. Those lime flavors are gonna go well with this uh, dish. The issue is that those lime flavors might be present in your mouth after you eat a bite of this food, or they might not, because, again, the food will change the wine and make it something different. So, I don't know, I know what the wine is now. I don't know what the wine's gonna be after taking a bite of this food, so we'll see. Load everything up on my fork here. And like I said, I'm getting that feeling now where everything is kind of building up in my palate, in my mouth. A little bit pasty, <laughs> not in a bad way, but again, there's lots of what I call food residual in my mouth right now that A, it's gonna change the wine, and B, I won't lift it. So we'll see what we get now. This is not a great example of a pairing, but it's a great example of how the wine changes. The stone fruit or the stoniness uh, was there in this wine. The minerality was there in the wine when I first tasted it by itself. Uh, but there's also other flavor elements involved. When I tasted it uh, after a bite of food, all I got was that stony minerality. <laughs> uh, that is not good. The wine itself is a very nice wine on, on its own. And it, with all these pairings, I'm never saying the wine's a bad wine. I'm just saying the wine is not a good pairing. And again, great wine, uh, bad pairing. Where it takes me is not where I want to be at all. This particular uh, Pinot Noir is a Oregon Pinot Noir, very high quality uh, Pinot Noir, one of the best, one of the first producers of Pinot Noir in Oregon, uh, and one of the ones that is the go-to. So it's a great wine, but whether it pairs, pairs well is a different thing. It smells great. Like, it smells kind of like cranberry sauce, so maybe. If the cranberry sauce complements the dish, then maybe the wine will. Very light, uh, not heavy, not a lot of tannin. Sort of dark berry fruit, not red berry fruit. Like the, cran the cranberry is very bright, tart red berry. This is kind of a darker, deeper um, berry fruit. Uh, sort of like a dark red cherry flavor. And th that goes well with the game, so maybe it works with the dish. When we tasted this dish, with a bunch of wines in our sort of tasting sessions, we saw that this dish tended to do something very interesting with the wines, especially red wines. The dish tended to suck in and make disappear the fruit and aromatic flavors in the wine. Uh, why is that important? Because if there aren't enough of those aromatic flavors, those fruit flavors in the wine to begin with, once it gets sucked in, you're left with the wine that's out of balance. You're left with a wine that's all structure and no fruit. And if the wine's just structure, it's not gonna be pleasing. I'm not sure if this is going to be great, only because it doesn't seem to have that depth of aromatic flavor, that sort of high concentration of aromatic flavor. I love all wines, it's a great tasting wine, 
just don't have my hopes high because the depth of flavor is not that great. Got a good bite of turkey there. Again, mellow, mild, very comforting dish. Like I predicted, mouthful of tannin. The tannins are really driven to the front there. And so I've got a lot of bitterness in my mouth and you know, they really were pumped up. The fruit flavors in the wine should balance out the structure in the tannins. Once those fruits are gone, then you're gonna be left with more tannin than anything else. When you greet it with that bitterness, <laughs> it's a rude awakening. Now, what I think is that you hope that the dish or the experience of the dish continues to go somewhere good because you're in that warm, comfy place with the, with the, with the turkey and the dressing and the gravy and all that. And you hope the wine will continue that. Um, <laughs> this wine stops it cold uh, with that tart bitterness. Um, not, not tart like cranberry sauce, but really sort of bitter uh, and just puts the brakes on a good experience. Internet, you let me down. So I'm sure there is a Pinot Noir out there that's gonna be fantastic with this dish, but this particular one, while it's a good wine, is not it. So this will not get you that, you know, wink from someone across the table saying, you know, you nailed the pairing. This doesn't nail the pairing. Zinfandel is gonna be big, high alcohol. It could have lots of tannin uh, or not. You know, there are two kinds of Zinfandels out there. If it has lots of tannin, I don't think it's to be good. It could also have lots of fruit. And I know that this dish needs a lot of fruit because the dish itself sucks in the fruit flavor. I don't know what it is, and it must be the fat in the gravy, but it sucks in the flavor can tend to leave the wine out of balance and tasting bad, tasting like it has too much structure, too much tannin, uh, and not enough fruit to balance that out. I'm not expecting good things. I'm sure it's a good wine. I've tasted this wine before, it's a tasty wine. Uh, let me taste the wine by itself to see if I can guess whether it's gonna be a good pairing or not. That is big and rich and dark and syrupy and great for some other dish. Uh, it, it would be amazing with, you know, I, people like Zinfandel with barbecue, like barbecue ribs. I imagine it could be, you know, fantastic with that. Uh, people also like it with burgers. I could just see that big, heavy, syrupy, dark fruit just, you know, running all over the, the turkey and not playing well at all. And playing well is really what I think makes for a good pairing. You have the experience that the food started and that's happy, it's a happy, pleasing experience then the wine just comes in and adds something to keep that good feeling going or even to take it to a better place and make it better. I can't imagine that's going to do it, but like I always say, you know, I give every wine a chance. I'm open-minded. All I love is a good pairing. So let's taste it and see what happens. This wine's got an interesting problem. I don't like the pairing. The, the pairing goes bad in a different way. Uh, I mentioned before that the dish can suck in the fruit flavors, leaving you with just structure. And the structure is the tannin and the acidity to some extent. This does it to some extent. Because the wine is so big and jammy and so you know, full of fruit, it does have enough fruit to survive the dish sort of sucking it in and taking it away. Um, it's kind of borderline, but it does have enough fruit. That's sort of the good news about the wine. The bad news about the wine is the fruit that, is, that persists, the fruit that you have in your mouth, uh, the fruit that is part of the experience after you buy this dish, is the wrong fruit. It's that really dark, you know, blackberry uh, fruit that um, is just too dark for this lighter, comforting experience. Uh, nothing in this dish is that heavy and dark. It, even the, the typical fruit accompaniment, the um, cranberry sauce, is a bright red fruit. Good, you know, good news, the wine has the, the fruit character to, to deliver en enough depth of flavor. Bad news, it's the wrong fruit. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to get you that wink, that nod from your friends that you want if it's a great pairing. There are a few wines that come to mind when something is going to pair well with a general or wide variety of dishes. One of those wines is champagne, not just any old champagne. Champagne itself you know, is a blend of different grapes. Some of them are red grapes, some are white grapes. It can have more flavor. This wine is a Blanc de Blanc Champagne, which is just Chardonnay. We chose that because we knew it was gonna have a cleaner finish. It was gonna be a cleaner wine, less likely to interfere with any of the taste on the dish. Blanc de Blanc is what makes this champagne different. 
Uh, one other thing, in all of our research, we found out that there are at least two different kinds of pairing experiences people like. One kind of experience is one where the dish goes, it gets you going in a good place, take a sip of the wine, it, gets, it keeps that good thing going, and it's really a sort of a continuation of the food experience. That's kind of the obvious pairing that people think of. We saw another experience is one where you just clean the slate. You just you know, wipe the chalkboard clean, but do it in a pleasing and beautiful way. We thought that given that there's so many different flavors on the plate, a great experience could be a kind of palate cleansing, blackboard erasing experience. And nothing is gonna do that better than a Blanc de Blanc champagne. The fact that the wine itself is clean, you know, refreshes the palate. The fact that there are bubbles helps you know, lift the weight off the palate and cleanse the mouth. The fact that it's high acidity, again, it's going to give you that lifting and cleansing aspect. Blanc de Blanc champagne is a winner with this dish. I'll take you through what's going on though. I talked before about the dish. The dish is not highly flavored, but it is very weighty. It does leave a lot in your mouth once they lift it. One other thing I should mention, Pierre Peter's Champagne, specifically Pierre Peter's uh, Blanc de Blanc. This is the champagne that wine insiders, consumers and industry people love to love. So if you show up at the dinner party with this, people that know their wine, but industry people or not, are definitely gonna give you the nod and go, you kinda know what's going on. So let me give that a taste, see what's happening. Nice aroma. Here, the bubbles are in the forefront. Um, sometimes you have bubbles that are soft and subtle. Sometimes you have bubbles that are much more in the forefront and bigger. I wanna say aggressive, but I don't mean aggressive in a bad way, kind of assertive. The champagne's kind of making a nice entrance. Those bubbles will come in very handy later with the dish, and I'll talk about that soon. But also, the flavor is just on the knife edge of neutral and interesting. It's interesting enough to make you go, you know, there's something special about this wine. This is a good wine. I can see this would be good with the dish because of the high acidity, because of the assertive bubbles, and because of the neutral nature of the aromas of the taste. Let's get in here and see what happens. Everything on this fork, it's a great tasting bite of Thanksgiving dinner. So, the great thing about this wine, the first thing that happens when you put it in your mouth you get those bubbles coming in. And really, um, when Irene and I tasted this wine with the dish, we talked about how the bubbles did a great job of cleansing the food residual and cleansing the palate. And we call them sort of scrubbing bubbles, like the cleanser. But when you, they come in right away and they do lift that way, they cleanse your mouth really well. And this dish, because everything here is kind of so sticky, you really need that. It's just a great wine for that reason. This is nice and neutral and palate cleansing. But again, interesting enough to say, you know, I'm not drinking nothing, I'm not drinking seltzer. I, <laughs> I could drink this wine with this dish all day long because it's, it's so light, it's so refreshing. It's adding so much to the experience. And what's really adding is refreshing your palate from the weighty, heavy experience of this dish, but doing it in a beautiful way. This is a pairing we love, the Pierre Peters uh, Champagne Blanc de Blanc. This is, I must warn you, this is about $55 a bottle, which you know, some might find pricey. For Thanksgiving dinner, you know, some people will want to or <laughs> will try to get you to spend a whole lot more. You don't need to. And maybe because the champagne itself is so rich, you know, the bottle will last longer. But I think this is a great experience. When I taste it, it's got nice acidity. It's got nice, really, the, 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 the fruit is almost indistinguishable from the cranberry fruit. It's very tart berry, you know, sort of tart red cherry, uh, maybe um, red raspberry. But two things you notice. One, the flavor is pure. There's it's nothing else. It's just purely that flavor. And two, this is a concentrated, deep glass of that flavor. That's going to be important in the pairing. What we saw when we tasted this dish with a bunch of other wines is that this dish tends to suck in fruit flavor. So you take a wine that's perfectly balanced. You take a sip of that wine after you buy this food. The food sucks in that flavor. And if you don't have enough flavor in the wine, then what you're left with is just the frame of the wine, just the structure, which is just the acidity and the tannin. And that alone is not gonna be a pleasing experience. And you want the wine to have enough fruit so that there's a, some fruit left to deliver that sort of reward, that treat, that fruit in the pairing experience to make it a good experience. And this wine, when I taste it by itself, I can tell it has it.
again, I would say this wine has depth of flavor and purity of flavor and appropriateness of flavor, a flavor that I know I can tell is gonna work with this dish. Because again, if cranberry sauce works for this dish and it has for years and years and years, this wine's gonna work with the dish. So let's get in here and give it a taste. So I get the food residual so it can have its impact. It's nice because it's got the depth of flavor to survive the food residual. It's got the purity of flavor to um, survive the dish. You're not left with tons of, of tannin. Uh, there's some acidity there to cleanse the food residual. But again, this is a good example of how a wine can show up at the end of the pairing experience to make you very happy. So we love this pairing. I think you'll love it too. I think it's a great glass of wine. It's a great experience to have in your mouth after a bite of food. Serve this, try this, please. It's really fantastic. I'm here today with Irene Miller, who is a fantastic sommelier. You know, here at Pairing Base, we try to work with the best wine professionals out there. And that's what Irene is. Irene, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hello, my name's Irene. I am just about to start as the beverage director at the Dominic Hotel in Soho, but previously I've worked in New York in several top-rated restaurants, Lincoln, Del Posto, uh, La Bernadette. Before that, I used to cook. So I have spent uh, a good amount of my life eating and drinking. I'm ready to do some more. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to get into this. Again, we wanted you to be able to get a great pairing no matter what. The best way to do it is to get these wines. If you can't, then we want you to be able to walk into the wine store and say, I want a Blanc de Blanc champagne that tastes like X. Or I want a Burgundy that tastes like Y. And so Irene's going to talk about what you should ask for specifically. So, do you want to talk about the uh, champagne first? Uh, so what we have here is uh, the Pierre Peters. It's a Blanc de Blanc. When I taste this wine, let's taste it just to make, just to, just to refresh my memory. Uh, so what I get here is a lot of lightness and freshness, notes of citrus, green apple, also some ripe pear notes. Uh, and then you get this lovely character uh, that happens with champagne as it ages and it develops this really nice sort of um, lightly toasty kind of brioche quality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also, you know, the, the texture here is very important. The bubbles here, the mousse here is very, very fine, very creamy. So what I find when you're eating this dish, you know, the bubbles help refresh your palate, but there's also this kind of lovely creaminess that creates this sort of, you know, symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. with, with the food. So it kind of simulates richness. It does, but then it finishes super clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, you know, I remember we tasted another Blanc de Blanc champagne that we didn't like as much as we liked this one. And the difference was the bubbles were not as much in the forefront. There were sort of softer bubbles and they didn't do as good a job of cleansing the palate. Right. And we, we, we joked that this champagne was sort of like scrubbing bubbles. Um, the, uh, the mousse did do a great job of cleansing your palate in addition to the acidity. Mm -hmm. And so those things are key. Yeah, the acid is, is super important here. Yeah, with, with this dish, um, when we tasted it by itself, we noticed that uh, it kind of hangs around in your mouth more than other dishes. Maybe right. because the gravy is heavy, because everything in there is kind of heavy and sticky. And so that's why you, you, you want, whether you know it or not, you want something to lift the uh, weight off your palate. That covers the champagne, right? I think so. Okay. It was tasty. The other wine we liked is this uh, Bourgogne Rouge from uh, Bach Domaine de Bachelet. Irene's going to talk a little bit about what you'd ask for in the wine store uh, if you can't find this guy. I mean, this is just a, a really lovely, elegant Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. It's very earth-driven. You get this uh, really pretty sort of like baking spice note to it, maybe a little bit of cedar, kind of pencil shaving, but there's also really kind of classic uh, red fruit, tart cherry, mm -hmm. there's some cranberry here. I think the cranberry, when you take a bite of this turkey and you have the cranberry sauce with it, I think I think it's really just a, an excellent pairing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you want like a super powerful style of burgundy, but I think that, that this one, it's it has enough elegance and enough structure and enough acidity to, to be a really nice pairing with this. Again, I, I remember when we tasted this burgundy against a bunch of other burgundies, uh, it, seemed, it seemed like this one had much more sort of depth of fruit or more concentration of fruit. When the dish kind of made some of the fruit go away a little bit, there was enough fruit left over to still right. be apparent in the dish. You want to make sure you have a burgundy that has some depth of flavor. Uh, would you call it concentration or just depth I of flavor? Think, I think they go hand in hand. Okay. I think you could, say, you could say one or the other. The food messes with the wine, uh, but you want to make sure the wine can survive that and stay what you want it to be. And you want it to be that tart, 
uh, red fruit, cranberry right. uh, to go with the dish. And it has a really lovely <coughs> mineral character here. Mm -hmm. I think some of the other peanuts we tasted were just were just kind of fruit and not much mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really about the layering of flavor here that makes it interesting with this dish, which can be, you know, very heavy. That, that, I remember um, there's something really interesting happened when we tasted this before. When we tasted it with a bunch of other Pinot Noirs, the dish seemed to suck in or sort of, you know, cancel out the fruit flavors or the aromatics and leave you with the frame or the structure of the wine. And so wines that did not have as much sort of concentration or depth of flavor, uh, you were left with just the, the structure uh, as the pairing result, and that wasn't so pleasant. Something that doesn't have depth of flavor is going to leave you kind of harsh and uh, with just sort of the frame and not the reward of, right, of the, good pairing. The flavor gets washed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A quick way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> So to summarize, when you go to the wine shop, what you should be looking for in terms of a champagne or a sparkling wine, uh, I think what's important here is that this is a Blanc de Blanc, so it's 100% Chardonnay. You have a lot of finesse and a lot of elegance. Fruit character here, you're looking at um, some citrus, some green apple, but also has this lovely sort of ripe pear note to it. Um, it has a fineness of mousse and of, and of bubbles that makes it really nice and creamy. Uh, and then it has this very sort of delicate, brioche sort of toasty note. With regard to the red, what we're looking for here, um, I would say burgundy is, re is really the key here uh, to the flavor profile. You're looking for bright red fruit, tart cherry, cranberry, but the wine also has this very lovely sort of mineral core. You get baking spice, you get some, some cedar, maybe some pencil shaving. So something with some, some de depth, some complexity, and some, some layering of flavor here. And something that's not too big, not too robust. You want tannin, you want acid here, but you, you don't want a monster. So you saw us taste all these wines with the dish. Some of them we loved, some of them we didn't love at all. Some of them got kind of messy in the mouth after a bite of food, and some of them were just took over the whole experience. It wasn't what we wanted. We hope you try some of these pairings. We really hope you try the ones that we like best, and we hope you'll tell us what you think. Also, if you got your own ideas that you've tasted with the dish and think are fantastic, please let us know those too in the comment box below. So thanks a ton for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.